All right, today we're joined by former Sega of America President Tom Kalinske. Tom, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Glad to do it. Awesome. Uh, first off, uh, what can you tell us about uh, what, what life is like for you these days? What do you What have you been up to? Well, I'm I'm uh, pretty busy actually. I'm I'm uh, executive chairman of a company called Global Education Learning, and we raise some money. And our focus is to uh, roll up education companies in China, and then start bringing U.S. content and curriculum into China. And so we own uh, the largest online site in China that moms go to for information on how to educate their children and for nutrition issues uh, regarding their kids. It's called Yaolan. And so I'm very busy on that. I go to China every other month, which is, is hard on the body, but uh, I love it o- over there. And then I'm also vice chairman of LeapFrog. And, of course, I was CEO and co-founder and involved with LeapFrog from the very beginning. Uh, and I stepped down in 2005 as CEO, and I'm, I'm still vice chairman on the board and, and very close with that CEO. And then I'm on the board of something called Cambium Learning Group, which is based out of Dallas. And uh, the... It is a combination of a lot of different education companies with one common theme. They all make curriculum and software for kids with learning issues. So that, that keeps me pretty busy. And then I'm on the board of a cancer drug development company, which uh, I don't know why I'm on the board because I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, <laughs> but uh, I'm supposedly helpful to them on business issues. So anyway, <laughs> and at LeapFrog, as you know, we use, we use a lot of video game technology to make educational content fun and interesting for young kids. So in that sense, I'm still involved a bit in the industry, although not like I was before. Right, I understand. And actually, uh, some people may not know it, but there's actually a, a Sonic learning game on, on uh, LeapFrog. That's correct. Uh, there's, so there's, that's kind of a... There's a there's, the Sonic game is a very good seller. Uh, and also, you may not know, but one of the great developers at at Sega, Ed Anunziata developed, uh, who did Echo, the Dolphin, and a of number of other things. Uh, Ed did a product for us called Mr. Pencil, which helps kids learn to write and learn uh, numeracy. And the character Mr. Pencil is delightful, and it's one of it is the best-selling uh, product on the LeapFrog system. Oh wow, I didn't know that. That's uh, that's interesting to hear. We're actually tr- hoping that we can get Ed on at the end of the month uh, to talk a little bit. Uh, about his career with uh, Sega and everything. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to talk to him about Mr. Pencil as well. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Really Ask interesting him about Mr. Pencil. Absolutely. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit uh, about Console Wars, uh, the uh, the book that was just released this week by Blake Harris. I'm sure you've had some time uh, to uh, read the book. Can you give us your thoughts on, on the book after you read it and uh, your your experience with it? Well, sure. I mean, it goes back a couple of years now when we started this. I mean, Blake contacted me and told me he wanted to do a book on the battle between Sega and Nintendo in the 1990s. And initially, i got to tell you, I was very skeptical. My initial reaction was, Blake, there's probably 200 people in the world that care. And he said, no, no, you don't, you don't understand. There's a lot of people that care about, the, about this. And it, it's such an, I think it's going to be an interesting story. And over time, he convinced me, and I literally spent weeks with Blake, uh, you know, lots and lots of time, both here and in, in New York. And he got to know my family and interacted with my kids a lot and with my wife, Karen. And, uh, and you know, I think he just did an amazing job of research on that period of time. Uh, he interviewed over 200 people, interviewed lots wow. of Nintendo people, lots of uh, independent game development people, lots of retailers. And I think he just did an amazing job of putting this story together and telling it in a, um, in a I think, a non-biased way. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, uh, finished the book, and it was, as someone who grew up during that era, uh, I, I kind of talked with Al about this last week, but as a kid growing up, during that time frame, all I cared about was playing the games. I didn't, you know, really care so much about who was making it or, you know, uh, or who was behind and actually developing the game. But as I got older and really appreciate more about these games, I definitely do care about some of the story behind all this. And uh, there wasn't just a, a lot of really good centralized information about what happened during that time frame during the console wars you know, kind of until Blake created this book. So just as a, a child of the 80s uh, who's now, you know, an adult, this is a great uh, resource for me and for us to be able to go to and, and kind of learn about what was really going on back then. 
Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoy it because I, I tell you I really like the book. Uh, I guess I uh, you'd expect me to, but I was just <laughs> I was frankly surprised at how how uh, well it was written and all the detail that he he got into things that I had certainly forgotten about. He he uncovered and then of course as I mentioned to you earlier, there's a lot of information that I didn't know at all about Nintendo and the Nintendo side of things. So for me, it was really a, a great opportunity to learn more about that period of time. That's incredibly interesting. Uh, of course, I'm sure you know that there's going to be a, a feature movie uh, based on the Console Wars book, and uh, we know that you're going to be uh, probably uh, you know central there in the, uh, the the movie. So have you given any thought to uh, whom you thought think would be a, a great actor to portray you in the movie? I I th- I, I really haven't. I joke about it. You know, I said to my wife, Karen, gee, I wonder if Brad Pitt will play me. And my daughters, uh, I think my daughters, Ashley and Nicole and, and Kelly said, no, it should be Bradley Cooper. And I said, oh, yeah, oh. Our, our, our abs look the same. So <laughs> I don't have any idea who, who should I could me. see that. I could actually see Bradley Cooper doing that. That would be, uh, that's actually a, a really good choice right there. We asked uh, Al that same question last week, and uh, he didn't even want to touch it because he was afraid that it would uh, possibly sway or affect who they ultimately chose. But you know Al extremely well over a long period of time. Knowing him like you do, who do you think would be a great actor to portray Al Nilsson? Oh, my goodness. You know, he'll hate <laughs> me, whatever I say. Uh, you know, Al is uh, a creative genius, and he's also very funny. Uh, he has a great sense of humor. And so, you know, on, on one hand, I would, I would say a Seth Rogen, but he would, he would not like me to say that, I know. <laughs> And obviously, the ultimate uh, choice will be up to, uh, to to Seth and Evan Goldberg and, and Scott Scott Rudin. But it's got to be somebody who's uh, who's who's as clever uh, and funny as Al is. So it's going to be a tough it's going to be a huff, tough tough uh, choice. Absolutely, it will be. Uh, continuing on uh, with with Al for a moment, uh, he's. You know, as as you kind of alluded to, but he's he's kind of famous for coming up with these really. Uh, unusual and interesting marketing uh, schemes and stuff during his time with Sega. Uh, he actually posted on Reddit uh, last week that he had an idea of uh, to market and promote Streets of Rage 2. He wanted to actually blow up a building. Yeah. And uh, so he ended up not being able to do that uh, for, for various reasons. But can you talk to us uh, some about uh, Al's somewhat uh, wild ideas and some of the ones that just you, you had to say, you know, no, Al, this one's too crazy. We cannot do that. Can you uh, talk to us? Do you remember any, oh, any gosh. stories like that? <laughs> well, you know, I, I do remember the blowing up the building idea. You know, and, and Al, frankly, I mean, he'd ha- he has 20 ideas for any particular subject. And, Generally, 18 of them aren't so hot, but two are really great, and you just got to pick the two out of the 20 to to run with. Uh, you know, I mean, I remember all the good ones, though. I mean, you know, this whole thing we did in the mall tours. I mean, we when you think oh, about yeah. that, running around the country and and demonstrating uh, Genesis with with uh, Sonic on it versus Mario uh, before they had launched. Um, Super NES. I mean, it was a brilliant idea. Some of the little things that that we that he came up with. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we had uh, representatives. We'd go out and we'd give a Genesis and some software to a really uh, uh, a avid game player on college campuses. And all we asked of him was that he show the Genesis and play games with his friends. But by doing that, it was kind of our way of virally marketing before there was a an internet where you could where you could do that uh, with. So, you know, he had, gosh, so many different great, great ideas. You're, I wish I'd known that one in advance. I would have, I would have looked through my records to find <laughs> old great Al ideas that we didn't do. <laughs> do you remember your reaction when he came to you and said that uh, I want to blow up a building to promote Streets of Rage 2? Yeah, I thought that was great. <laughs> but unfortunately, there are legal and insurance uh, 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 reasons why we weren't able to to do that. You know, if we'd had more time, maybe we could have worked through some of those those obstacles, and it really would have been quite funny. That would have been. Uh, I think that would have went down as one of the all time. Uh, most epic moments in video game marketing right there, blowing up an entire building for Streets of Rage. That would have been uh, quite amazing. Um, 
you know, reading through the book, one of the things that uh, I that I really learned and I didn't know at the time was the the kind of uh, office atmosphere that was built at Sega during your time there, and it, it really delved into how hard and how much committed the team was there, and I think they really, uh, you know, embraced that David versus Goliath mentality of, you know, Sega coming in and taking on Nintendo, and, you know, it, it talked about how hard and the all-nighters that you worked before CES to, to get ready for the, you know, when you learned about Nintendo's price drop, and you had to hurry up and, and try to match it, you pulled an all-nighter and everything like that, yeah. but at the same time, it almost seemed like a, a, a family atmosphere as well. Can, uh, can you kind of talk about your time there and, and what it was like in, in, in the team there? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the things that you have to do when you're in the role I was in as CEO of, of Sega of America, and the most important thing you do is get the right people, hire the right people. And we, I think, did a great job of, of making sure that we hired really smart people. Sometimes we put them in roles that weren't quite the role that they had expected, but because they were so smart, they were able to to do well. And, you know, Al Nielsen and Madeline uh, Canapa Schroeder and Michael and Christine Risley and uh, and uh, Ellen Beth Van Buskirk and Joe Miller and Paul Rio, uh, Diane Fernassier, Pam Kelly. These were great people, really smart people. And we all got along pretty well. You know, we we fought. I mean, you know, we had a <laughs> it was funny. We, we our head of uh, R&D, of course, was Joe Miller. And uh, and he used to fight cats and dogs with our head of sales, Rich Burns. But they'd go out afterward and have a beer. You know, uh, it was very much a, a family atmosphere. And we did not mind working uh, in inordinate hours. And you're right. Having an enemy, having a target, Nintendo as a target, that un- that was a unifying uh, uh, call there. You know, we 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 do anything we could. To defeat Nintendo, make fun of Nintendo, uh, try to get a reaction out of Nintendo, <laughs> and and so that kind of unified us and and made for a very much a family atmosphere inside the company. And I'm sure I've forgotten 20 names that I should have just mentioned, but uh, we're still all good friends. That's the other strange thing about this: we all still uh, stay in touch as much as we can, and we're all good friends. That's amazing. Yeah, Al uh, mentioned that uh, he was just having dinner uh, with you just last week. So yeah. I, I found that that, that that really that was just a really great to hear how close you still are after all these years. Uh, now, one of the things that uh, the book also uh, briefly talks about is while you were you know building up Sega, is some of the the moral kind of dilemmas or or, or you know battles that you had within yourself about bringing over some of these more adult-oriented and violent video games within Sega. Uh, you did that to you know, try to really differentiate Sega from Nintendo at the time. Uh, now, you know, fast forward to today, you know, obviously video games have become uh, much more violent, and because of these machines that are much more powerful compared to the 16-bit systems, they're much more realistic as well. Uh, can you tell me uh, your thoughts on violence in video games sure. today and and if you were, you know, if you were still Sega of America's president, would you have a, a problem today bringing some of those video games out to a Sega platform? Well, you know, my whole point on uh, on that part of our marketing strategy was we wanted to differentiate ourselves from Nintendo by appealing to an older audience. And so instead of being a kid's business, we pur- purposefully went after teens and college kids and older in particular. Okay. And after a while, you know, you do have these moral dilemmas. Gee, should we have more combat with blood or not blood? That was certainly uh, caused a lot of uh, consternation inside of the company. And I don't think I'm pretty sure Japan didn't agree with me. But I I felt that, uh, hey, if we're going to appeal to an older audience, we've got to give them realistic games to be engaged with. And, you know, the other side of the coin was I then felt we needed to establish a rating system. And so inside of Sega, we put together a a board of of professors and sociologists and educators and developed our own rating system. And we tried to mimic the the movie rating system. And, of course, later, much of that work became the current uh, video game rating system. But we we had our own inside of Sega and put it on the packaging before before the industry industry did. So to answer your question, though, yeah, today, if I were if I were still uh, there, uh, I definitely would, just as the movie industry has has um, 
mature, uh, you know, movies and R-rated huh. movies and PG movies and G movies, I think the video game world has to be the same way. We do products for young children, we do products for teens, and we do adult-oriented uh, products that are the kinds of things adults today would expect to be engaged with. So I don't have a problem with it. Okay, awesome. Uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit when you're kind of going back and, and referring to some of the uh, really notable people within the company. Uh, but I want to touch on this subject for a moment. Uh, you know, it's been it's been documented uh, pretty pretty well, especially in recent years, how women have have had a hard time carving out a place for themselves within the video game industry. Uh, but you know, during your time as CEO and president at Sega of America, you had several instrumental women who worked there, uh, women like uh, Madeline Schroeder, Ellen Van Buskirk, and Diane Adair. Can you talk a little bit about their impact on the success of Sega while you were president there? Well, sure. I mean, they were, they, they were, they were the part of the team that I just mentioned a minute ago. And by the way, Diane Adair is Diane Farnassier now. She, you know, she got married and oh, had a couple of kids. So, so, uh, <laughs> uh, and there's others. There was Diane Drosnes as well. Uh, so we had a, we had a number of, of, uh, of very bright, powerful women in the industry. And I know we were kind of the first to really do that. I guess Nintendo had, had one or two, but we had, uh, an equal number, I would say maybe more, more successful women in our company than, than we did, uh, did men. And I know it was tough for them because it's such a male dominated industry. I know it was hard for them at times to relate and to put up with the banter and the male humor and, and all of that, but they did it very well and very gracefully and would remind us every now and then that, uh, that some of the humor and, uh, you know, and some of the activities weren't appropriate for, <laughs> uh, for an office. And I really appreciated that. And I think they taught us guys a lot about, uh, about business today. Uh, and I know, for example, Michaeline uh, Christine Reesley is I think she's written a book on this subject of, of, uh, of uh, you know, how to uh, and she's been involved in some documentaries on women in business and uh, shattering the glass ceiling and upward mobility of, of women. So I think we were we kind of uh, we were at the forefront of women in business and management uh, moving upward. And I thought it was good for us. Absolutely. That was something I, 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 that really kind of stuck out at me when I was uh, reading that. And it was just seemed like, you know, every chapter I, I kind of got through at the book, there was another prominent female that you hired and brought in and was actually doing incredibly important work in the company. And, and it was a, a very advanced, uh, you know, uh, thing you did there that was that was really notable. Uh, of course, one of the, the legendary stories about that time frame uh, with the Sega Genesis and then leading up to Sonic the Hedgehog uh, launch in America was Madeline uh, traveling to Japan to meet with you know, Sega, of, uh, Sega of Japan and trying to convince them to uh, make some very uh, you know, instrumental changes to the, the look of Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, you know, seeing how culturally different America is with Japan and how it's a much more male-dominated society – and culture there, was there ever any hesitation on sending Madeline, since she was a, a woman, there to do such an important task? No, not, a, not at all. I mean, and you're absolutely right, of course. I mean, it, it's mm -hmm. just unheard of, particularly back in that time. I mean, even today, it's still difficult for women in business in Japan. But back in that period of time, there weren't many powerful, outspoken women in, in Japanese companies. And in walks Madeline, attractive and bright and kind of uh, takes on these very uh, opinionated male uh, uh, developers <laughs> and, and marketers. Uh, you know, I, I think Nakasan probably just didn't know what the heck to do <laughs> when confronted by, by Madeline telling him that you got to change Sonic. You know, you got to get rid of those fangs. You have to make him more <laughs> approachable. And by the way, his, his girlfriend can't be named Madonna and have her boobs hanging out of the dress, you know. So, I, you know, I think it, it, it must have just floored them. Uh, I wasn't at that particular meeting, but I was at other meetings where she, mm -hmm. she was present and I saw how they reacted to her. And I think she, you know, they didn't know what to make of her. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Maybe that was uh, just the secret weapon you guys needed at the time to, to really do that, to kind of, you know, catch them off guard a little bit and then, you know, uh, you know, really go in there and, and, and show them your plan to, uh, Kind of relaunch and uh, you know reimagine uh, Sonic there, but that was a that was an amazing story within the book that I, I really enjoyed. 
Um, now, one of the things that the book also does is highlight a lot of the successes that Sega had uh, during that time, you know, numerous uh, different marketing programs that worked really, really well. Uh, but there was there were some projects that didn't actually turn out uh, probably as well as you liked and didn't resonate as well uh, with gamers that you're hoping for something like maybe the Sega channel. Uh, for instance, I'm sure you're familiar with the Sega channel. Uh, do you think that it was just ahead of its time there? Or what can you tell us about Sega channel and why you don't think it, it may have caught on like you were hoping yeah. for? Well, I, I think it was a really brilliant idea, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a lot of fun to, to get involved with. But man, were there problems. Uh, uh, I'll tell you one aside, by the way. So when originally when we were planning to do the Sega channel, we were doing it only with Time Warner and Time Warner Systems. And one day the phone rings and it was the TCI, a TCI executive. And basically he said, you can't do this with just Time Warner. And, you know, John Malone ran TCI and he's got this reputation of being a bit of a, a tough guy. And uh, <laughs> this fellow on the phone was clearly his lieutenant and clearly mouthing his words and said, somebody's going to be at your door, your office tomorrow and you better meet with him. And I, so I did, you know, I, I don't oh, want to wow. offend John Malone. <laughs> and so we ended up with this deal with TCI coming into the venture and Time Warner accepting them in the venture which gave us really broad uh, coverage of the United States market. But the difficulties were, and I, I don't know if every, literally every market had a different set-top cable box uh, mm. controller, if you will. And to get our system to work on every one of these devices was literally, we had to, to design it so it could work with 50 different uh, set-top boxes. Oh, wow. Um, and, 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 and even then the limitations were, as I don't recall exactly, but it was something like you could pick from a menu and have downloaded six or eight games or something like that into it and then play those on your, on your Genesis. And it was originally $15 a month, I believe. We might have dropped the price to 12 or even $10 a month later. But we did get, uh, I'm not, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we got like 150,000 people that signed wow. on. So it wasn't a complete failure, but it didn't work mm -hmm. that well because of these right. set-top box problems uh, connecting with all of them. And so eventually, uh, it, you know, it, it was dropped. But I think it was a heck of a good idea, and I think it was ahead of its time, um, you know, and uh, that's just kind of the way it went. Awesome. And <clears throat> kind of continuing on with that theme, uh, one of the things that, that Sega did during that time, which I myself – I, I do enjoy, and a, a lot of people kind of criticize, but was along with the Genesis releasing add-on uh, accessories or add-on peripherals for the system, like the 32X and the Sega CD. I mean, I'm sure you can look in the background. I have uh, both yeah. models of the Sega CD and the 32X back there, so I'm very much a fan of that and, and, and quite enjoy it. But uh, what, did you, what are you, your thoughts looking back on that? Do you think uh, that was kind of the, the right direction to go with releasing these add-on units, or maybe... Do you think focusing on something like the CDX, which was kind of like a combo system within itself uh, earlier in that uh, generation, would have been the way to go? Yeah, good good question. And, and of course, history allows me to uh, reflect on it pretty well. <laughs> sure. I think they're two very different situations, by the way. The the Sega CD and doing uh, optical disc, uh, doing games on optical discs was an unknown uh, territory back then. Nobody knew how to do it well. And so it Firstly, the reason we did any add-on was to try to extend the life of, of Genesis. But in the case of the CD, it really was also to learn how do you make games that are as fun and enjoyable and, and uh, fast as we can do on cartridge. How do you do that on an optical disc? Because back in those days, you had to basically do kind of linear games and, and store ahead of where the player was where they were going to go. Well, that means you had to know where they were going to go, and that only works on certain types of games. There's a lot of games where that just doesn't work. So, uh, so it was a it was a programming and development challenge, and I'm really glad we did it. We I think if we hadn't, there would have been a, a big gap in years of people learning how to program on it. And by the way, of course, our partner was Sony, very purposefully was Sony. We right. we pursued them, and they pursued us. <laughs> they owned this little studio, Image Soft, down in Santa Monica, and uh, so we did together kind of funded the development work on optical disc games. Uh, and, of course, that was a, a great relationship 
for us. So that's the that's the the CD story is a bit different than the 32x story. The 32x uh, now you can look back and say, gee, that was a mistake. Remember, its reason for being was to extend the life of Genesis. And I, I know if you've read the book, you know I was pretty skeptical of the of the Saturn uh, chipset and uh, and really wanted something a bit different and. And I was kind of hoping we could keep Genesis going a lot longer. Right. And I thought if we did 32X and were able to provide the same kind of play as a 32-bit system on a 16-bit machine, uh, that would help prolong the life of Genesis. The unfortunate part is we in, at Sega US, Sega of America, w- the games we developed weren't good enough. And we were supposed to get support from Japan. And we didn't, you know, so we had a very limited number. I've got them all in my basement. Uh, uh, I don't remember how many it was. It wasn't very many, six or something <laughs> like that. We didn't get a lot of games out on 32X, and so, of mm-hmm. course, it was a, a failure. Right. Well, I, I have uh, quite a few on, on my shelf, uh, too, but I'm sure not uh, not as many as you do. But kind of continuing on with the, uh, the 32X, there was... Uh, probably quite a lot of uh, prototypes that uh, Sega was working on during that time frame, and uh, maybe some that uh, we still don't know about today. But one of the ones that we have seen, and I think there's maybe been a couple that have been shown publicly, was the Sega Neptune, which was uh, kind of a, a, a strange hybrid device, but that played 32X uh, uh, cartridges. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Sega Neptune and uh, what it, you know, what its purpose was going to be, and and ultimately why uh, it didn't end up seeing the uh, you know the the light of day at retail? Yeah, it was a, it was. Uh, I'm trying to remember who uh, one of the Japanese uh, chip companies helped us on the development of that, and I right now can't remember the name of which, which one it was. It was one of the big ones, um, and it was again it was to 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 launch a new system that we thought was a good 32-bit system at a reasonable price, but as it turned out, because we didn't have the right games for it, it never it never really got off the ground. Uh, I'm surprised mm. you have a prototype of it, actually. I, I don't have a prototype, personally. I would love, I would love one, but uh, I think the uh, the video game uh, uh, history museum has one, and, and there's another one floating around. There's there's photos of it on the internet. Uh, yeah. It looks uh, from just aesthetically, it looks like a, a very sleek. Yeah. System. It looked it looked great, but um, is was there any other uh, you know prototypes or anything like that that you can remember that uh, you know didn't end up launching that you can tell us about at oh, all? Oh sure, sure. I, well, I think the one that was really fun and interesting was virtual reality, mm. and we we had a, a virtual reality uh, uh, headset, got you know goggles and uh, and audio, and we were we started working with. Uh, I think a guy named Jaron Lanier, who's sort of the father of virtual reality. And we went on to explore this area because we thought that that would really be an immersive, great experience. And we had some games developed where you could put the headset on and literally enter a world and wander around that world uh, in in three dimension. And it was really cool. Um, the (laughs) The problem was you also tended to get motion sickness (laughs) <laughs> and uh, fall over <laughs> when oh, you no. were doing this. Uh, so it was it was a little. Uh, we didn't have the uh, we didn't work out those details pro- uh, ever. Uh, uh, and and then there was this other thing going on back then. I don't. I think you probably remember this. Do you remember the uh, the epilepsy incidents with certain video game players? There was yes. A, there was an incidence of it. Uh, fortunately for us, it was mostly on Nintendo systems. But it was uh, a luminosity uh, epilepsy or something like that. It's caused by the 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 rate frame rate that games uh, basically blink at that you and I can't see, but our brain knows is going on. And uh, well, this VR thing really set that off. You know, with people who oh, had wow. that issue, this was not a good thing to to <laughs> allow them to wear. So because of all those issues, we didn't do uh, uh, virtual reality. Oh, that's too bad. Was there any? Uh, do you remember any uh, code names or or the the name of the unit that you had planned on calling it at all? The the oh. VR the Sega VR unit. Oh gosh, we always had so many code names. <laughs> we'll have to ask Al that one, or, or right, Madeline, okay. Madeline, or or Diane. They they probably remember. Sure, fair enough. And it looks like virtual reality may finally come to the video game industry. Sony is is working on their Project Morpheus, and then we have the Oculus Rift, uh, which uh, was recently purchased by Facebook. But that's going to be quite an interesting uh, you know time in video games now where we're 
you know, might finally get virtual reality. You yeah, know? I think yeah. that's kind of interesting. I, and I think it, it could be a great experience if they solve those issues of, uh, of it causing you to get uh, ill. And the other thing that's, right. that's really cool is I've seen some early work, uh, and I guess there, it, was already, it was already presented, but the whole idea of, of mind control controlling the action on video games, I guess somebody's done a little bit on that in the past. But right. recently there's a company up here in the Bay Area that seems to be making real progress in that, uh, and it's surprising. It's actually surprising how well it works. Wow, that seems like something out of science fiction, way more than virtual reality yeah. does, I think. That, that would be absolutely amazing to, uh, to see if that actually comes to market. Uh, now, one of the neat stories on Nintendo's side that was uh, touched on in the Console Wars book was their relationship with Sony and how they had planned on partnering with Sony to uh, develop a CD-ROM add-on for the Super Nintendo, uh, but famously they spurned uh, Sony for Philips. Uh, during that time, and uh, that was, uh, you know, retold in, in great detail in the book, uh, which is really great. Uh, but what do you think uh, the lasting impact would have been on the industry had Sony not spurned, or I'm sorry, uh, had Nintendo ended up partnering with Sony? Do you think it would have just been a matter of time before Sony ended up entering the uh, the console wars at some point? Yeah, I, I think they would have. I mean, I think they're at least I think I believe Olaf's long term strategy was always to uh to, to do that. Uh and and I was of course really glad that, that Nintendo and they didn't get along because that made our relationship with Sony all, all the stronger. And, and and you know, I think you know the story about we did have a partnership and an agreement uh at Sega of America and Sony of America to uh to develop one new video game system that we'd each market and we'd share whatever the development costs and probable loss on it was, but we'd each benefit from the software sales. And of course, I thought mm -hmm. this was the greatest deal in the world because we were so <laughs> much better at doing software in those days than Sony was. I thought, wow, this is, this is going to be a killer for us. It's going to increase our profit margins dramatically. And then, of course, uh, while Sony Japan agreed to it, Sega Japan did not. So kind of a oh, similar no. spurn yeah. that uh, Nintendo did of Sony, or Sega mm -hmm. Japan did of Sony. Oh, wow. Uh, I don't know if you saw the recent news, but uh, Philips is actually suing Nintendo now and uh, trying to get them to cease all sales of the Wii U for patent infringement. So it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of a that news came out earlier this week. So I saw that and I, I kind of laughed to myself. Oh, God. Interview with you. So it still <laughs> continues. Kind of full circle. The, right. Yeah, you can't, absolutely. You can't change their stripes. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I, uh, I, I really chuckled to myself when I saw those headlines, though. Um, now, it was. It was really cool, and I had no idea that this happened with uh, when when Trip Hawkins called in a meeting uh, with you, and they basically this is when he was uh, running EA, and he basically told you that they had cracked the Sega Genesis and were now wanting to develop uh, games on the Sega Genesis without paying any royalties. Uh, what was uh, that was a, a really crazy thing, and I didn't even know that that is could legally be done. I, that yeah. seemed so illegal to me reading the book. I was like, yeah. "Is that really? Is that could that really be done?" Um, but it, it really was interesting seeing the relationship between you and Trip in that meeting uh, between you two. I felt the tension reading that book. It was, man, it was almost like palpable. It was, it was really great. But can you kind of take us back to that meeting and then what you uh, you know left thinking about Trip Hawkins <laughs> after that meeting? Well. You know, the one thing Blake didn't accurately report was some of the language used was a little <laughs> stronger than uh, than what he wrote. There were some pretty <laughs> severe swear words used during that meeting. It was extremely tense meeting. And, mm -hmm. and, and by the way, to your point, this was all news to me, you know, relative right. news to me. I didn't know it was legal to reverse engineer uh, a hardware device and then publish your own. So, so, software on it without paying a royalty or or buying the uh, cartridges as was our case generally from 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 the the owner of the uh, the manufacturer so it was a it was a very tense meeting uh I, it is other than the language accurately portrayed in the book uh the i remember my my line when i was really angry was <laughs> trip didn't your mother ever teach you the difference between right and wrong and of course, he blasted it back at me, and uh, and then we finally, we, of course, we reached agreement on a, a very much favorable royalty rate or or price that Trip uh, and EA would pay us, 
And we also agreed that we would get to use the Madden engine for Joe Montana football, which was a, a long held secret up, up until recently. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, of course that worked very much in our favor for a couple of reasons. First of all, the, I don't know if you remember this, but the first year that both games were out, Montana actually outsold Madden. Uh, oh, wow. I didn't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of funny. It probably wasn't as, as good a game, but it outsold, it outsold Madden because of the name Joe Montana, I guess at that time. Um, but, you know, EA benefited greatly from this relationship. EA was in real financial trouble at that particular time because they were doing games for PC and, and Apple, and the market just wasn't there. And so a couple of years later, I think we accounted, we, Sega, accounted for 80% of their profits. So it worked very well for EA. On the other hand, the EA guys, and I'm friends with all of them still, say to me, or at least most of them, you know, they say to me, hey, if it hadn't been for EA, you wouldn't have been successful. And of course, there's there's some truth to that, too. Now, Tripp and I have made up. We are we are <laughs> friends again. So uh, I hope this I hope his reading of this won't set him off and get him angry at me. Again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is funny. Um, kind of continuing on with the uh, the the unlicensed games. I you know, I, I was familiar with the the wisdom tree. Uh, Bible games that were released on Nintendo right. platforms, uh, you know, a long time ago. But I didn't realize until recently that they actually released a few on the Sega Genesis as well. I actually bought this at a, yeah. a record store this weekend. This is uh, the Exodus Journey to the Promised Land. And yeah. it's been well documented that Nintendo didn't want to get in any lawsuits because they didn't want to, you know, for more of a publicity, a public relations thing, uh, they didn't want to sue a, a Christian yeah. Uh, you know, uh, publisher. Is this was that kind of the same rule of thought that uh, uh, that or school of thought that you guys uh, went through with that? Well, you know, I'm basically a marketer, and that's a huge <laughs> audience. You know, there's a lot of people that are interested, and in, and uh, so I, I didn't have uh, any I didn't have any qualms about it at all. I, uh, even though our basic strategy was was teens and older and perhaps more aggressive. I didn't have qualms about that. I thought it's a big market. Why shouldn't they be able to enjoy uh, Christian stories and interactivity in gameplay regarding uh, Christianity on on a Genesis? I, you know, basically thought it was a good idea. Oh wow, that's that's a that's actually a a, a pretty uh, good way of thinking. I think that's that's pretty neat. Uh, now going back to Nintendo uh, momentarily, uh, it was uh, detailed in in, in really good. Uh, you know, ways in the book, how the the big failure with the Super Mario Brothers movie with Nintendo was. And I'm sure at the time that you guys took a, a lot of joy seeing them, uh, you know, kind of struggle there. Uh, on the other hand, Sega did kind of kind of in similar ways. You you brought Sonic to TVs, but you did uh, animated uh, TV shows. You did a weekly and a, and, a, and a daily TV show. But during that time, was there ever any talk or serious discussion of trying to bring uh, Sonic the Hedgehog to movie theaters and to the silver screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We did talk about it. But, you know, it was, it's a huge effort to internally manage the I mean, the television shows were very successful, by the way. I'm sure you're aware of that. I mean, the, right. still it, going today. Still, it's still going to my amazement. <laughs> right. it's still, they're still on today in a, in a lot of markets. Uh, and it was First of all, it was we did it, of course, to build the brand and build the image of Sonic the Hedgehog and reaching millions and millions of people on television every week really helps in that regard. Sure. But we also were trying to do really good stories. And so we had to have guys inside and gals inside review all the scripts and work on the scripts with the guys who and gals who wrote them. And it's a lot of work, you know, to do all that. And so I think that that sort of consumed us for quite a period of time. And at that time, we were talking about a movie, but we just never we never got it off. We never got it off the, the ground. And maybe they maybe they'll still do it. Oh, well, that would be interesting. Um, yeah, I would uh, actually be into that. They're actually coming out with a uh, new Sonic Boom cartoon here, I think, later this this fall or so. Yeah, I heard uh, that. I don't know if you're aware about that. Yeah, so I'm, that, I'm aware. That'll be I think it's the first CG Sonic uh, cartoon as well. So that's going to be interesting to see there. Uh, now, you negotiated some incredibly uh, important deals, and, and one of the ones they talked quite a bit about in the, the book was the Walmart deal, which took you know months and months 
uh, to actually come to fruition, and, and you went through great, great uh, pains of, of making that deal happen. Uh, but that was one of the ones that really stuck out at me, and I, I, I don't, won't spoil it because that's a, just such a great story in the book. I'll just let our listeners read that part. But are there any deals looking back that uh, you you weren't able to make that kind of stuck with you and, and kind of uh, you really like look back, you're like, you know, I really wish I would have got that one. Boy, that's a good question. Um, I'm sure there must have been some licenses that we weren't able mm-hmm. to get for a, for a reasonable price that that we wanted. Uh, I, I know we, we did have a good relationship with, with Disney and did quite a few uh, Disney ones. I, I, by the way, I, uh, did, do you know the, the Fantasia story? No, uh-uh. Well, I'll we got that license. And so, and you know, it's a classic movie, one of the great sure. uh, Disney movies that Walt actually had a heavy hand in. And uh, so we got that license, and we did a great game. Uh, but I got a call from the head of Disney uh, at that time. I don't know what it was called, Disney Interactive or Disney Licensing or what, that he had to see me the next day. And we had just shipped <laughs> 50,000 to retail and had an, and had 150,000 in our warehouse. So 50,000 just filled the shelves. That's the initial order and 150,000 sitting in our, in our warehouse ready to go. Oh, and wow. uh, I met this executive at the airport and he says, Tom, you have to pull the game back. And oh, I, no. what the heck? <laughs> I, I thought maybe our programmers had put something in there, you know, a little surprise somewhere <laughs> that was inappropriate as they tended to try to do from time to time. And uh, no, that wasn't it. It turned out that the, they didn't have that Roy did or Walt Disney before he died said to them, he never wanted Fantasia to be commercialized and licensed. And Roy Disney of course was still alive at that point. He's now deceased. And he just came down on the guys at Disney and said, you, you got to stop this. This is against Walt's wishes. And so we had to pull back we had to pull back all 50,000 out of retail. I'm sure some sold and are somewhere in houses and are great collector items today. I have one, by the way. Uh, and, oh, wow. and the rest we, the rest we pulled back. And for that, Disney gave us special terms on the next uh, hot movie <laughs> that came out. So anyway, that's not answering your question. I, I know we didn't get some licenses that we went after. I know our relationship with certain developers wasn't as strong as I wanted it to be. And I know we failed in in that regard sometimes. But generally, uh, you know, my my way of acting is I guess I only focus on the successes. So I only remember the successes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, there is a, a many of the the the, Di- the Sega Disney games uh, are are well remembered uh, to this day. Do you remember what you did with all the excess cartridges? It's not one of those uh, ET Atari landfill like stories where you just kind of dump them all or anything like that, did you? No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. We never we never made that. I don't remember us ever making that big of a inventory purchase mistake that we weren't able to deal with. You know, and deal with what do you do? So if you have, if you've ordered too much of something, how do you deal with it? You lower the price, you discount it, you use it as in a promo deal or something. We always got rid of uh, uh, our cartridge inventory. I, I remember us having huge, huge issues in that regard. One of the uh, the one of the things that stuck out at me and was one I, I thought it was an absolutely brilliant move. And we talked a little bit about uh, that with Al. Was what do you do with the the uh, Sega Genesis consoles that were bundled with Altered Beast when you're bringing out new Sega Genesis consoles that are bundled with Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, and you actually went out and, and decided that we'll just give Sonic the Hedgehog away for people that uh, bought or recently bought the Altered Beast bundled Sonic Genesis or Sega Genesis. And I thought that was a, an absolutely brilliant move on your part to try to decide on, you know, how do you move these units and also keep your fan base happy. Yeah, and also it would have been so expensive to pull them back and repackage and take the cartridge mm-hmm. out. It, you know, it wasn't worth all that that kind of effort. When and remember, we're in a battle here. We want to get more consoles in hand, so just add a Sonic to the basic purchase. And uh, hey, those lucky people got Altered Beast and Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> that is a great move. Uh, now, you know, continuing on with your your relationship building that that you spent a lot of time on. Uh, you did a lot of that with your retail partners, uh, building yep. that 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 up throughout the years. Uh, now, going back to uh, to E3 uh, 1995, uh, 
you know, the, a lot of people look back at that. That's when you announced the Saturn yeah. was going to be available, and it was also going to be available that, you know, that uh, basically immediately. That day. Uh, it was called Sat- yeah. Saturn Day. It was on September 2nd, 1995. Now, a lot of people look back at that and said that uh, you angered a lot of these yeah. uh, retail partners that, uh, you know, that you created or you, or you forged these relationships with. Can you talk, take us back to that? And sure. is that really the case? Did you anger those people or was there, you know, s- other things going on uh, back in the background that, you know, a lot of people may not know about even today? Oh, yeah, there was a lot going on. <laughs> uh, again, you know, I, first of all, was a re- reluctantly dragged along on the Saturn launch to start <laughs> right. with. Uh, and and clearly, when anytime you launch a platform, you, you have to have adequate, good software. We certainly should have learned that lesson from 32X and, and from other co- other competitors' a- activities. You have to have great games. And so I was not in favor of the of the Saturn launch uh, on that day. I, this was, you know, I had been allowed to make decisions pretty much independent of Sega Japan up until about this point, and I was ordered to introduce Saturn immediately. And the feeling by uh, the Nakayama and the and the board in Japan was that we had to get ahead of the other uh, other competitors with uh, with a 32 bit bit launch we couldn't wait any longer even though we didn't have enough or very many uh, good games so i was i did not want to do this and i was ordered to so i did and uh it did anger retailers i remember you know i had a lot of friends at retail i spent my whole life building retail relationships with uh, all of these guys you know i was right. very good friends with the senior management and almost every retailer in America. And I remember the, a very close friend at KB was so mad at me. I think he's still mad at me today. You know, I mean, it was just, he was offended that we would only, cause we didn't have enough quantities either. So we were only shipping Toys R Us and uh, I forgot one of the, mm. one of the, you know, not a Best Buy, but one of the independent. And so, right. you know, we offended uh, the retail America greatly through this strategy and it was not a smart thing to do in my opinion. Right. It's always a uh, hindsight is 2020, but it seems like you kind of knew that going into that, that that uh, was not a, uh, a smart way to go about it. Yeah. Uh, you touched on some of the, uh, some of the neat little uh, pieces that you still have from your time at Sega, the, uh, the Fantasia uh, game and, and some of the other things. What, uh, what other little bits of Sega memorabilia do you have? And what's the, the one piece that you have from your time at Sega that you value the most? Oh gosh. Well, uh, on my wall here, I have in this particular, I have two offices here. And in this particular office, I have the one millionth, uh, Sonic 2 that was made. I have the, uh, uh, first game we ever manufactured in the, in the United States. I have the first Sega CDs that we, that we ever did. Uh, so those are, those are pretty special, pretty special to me. Uh, the whole Sonic episode, if you will, is very special to me. I have a lot of those. Of, uh, I have all of the games, obviously, but I also have a lot of the videos from the television shows. I have plush Sonics around here. I see one behind you back there. Oh, actually, one me. <laughs> <laughs> my dog got hold of that one, chewed one eye off. Uh, <laughs> oh no! Um, but I have a lot of Sonic uh, memorabilia in in the house. Of course, many Genesis units and Mega uh, and uh, and CD units and CDX and Game Gear. I loved I loved Game Gear. I thought that was a wonderful first color mobile uh, product, and we did very very well with it. So I have all those games here somewhere. So I, you know, it's hard for me to say one thing other than other than maybe the Sonic Two One Millionth, which of course we went on and made millions more. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, those were special. That's amazing that you still have all that all that stuff hanging in your office. So that that those are uh, collectors' items that uh, many people out there would love uh, to add to their collections, uh, most certainly. Yeah, Al uh, was Al was down in my basement the other day when we were having dinner after we had dinner, <laughs> and I have all literally all of the games and uh, alphabet alphabetized, and wow. uh, there's also I have a whole bunch of the posters. And Al was saying, oh. "Gee, you got to put these on eBay and sell them. They're worth <laughs> a lot of money." I had no idea. You know, I just have them around the house. 
You know what? If if you like, you can uh, ship them out to us, and we promise <laughs> that we'll uh, we'll take very good care of them. Um, now, you know, obviously, you left. Sega uh, long before they departed uh, from the console business with the Dreamcast. Uh, now, looking back, do you do you feel that that was the right move for Sega at the right time, or do you think that there was any way of salvaging the Dreamcast and kind of staying course in the console business and and actually you know coming out of there uh, you know still afloat? Yeah, well, of course. I, I as you said, I was not involved with with mm-hmm. Dreamcast. Uh, I had left the company. Uh, and I, and, you know, I left on, on good terms, but I left, right. I left the company, uh, and I got involved in how they were launching, uh, Dreamcast. But, you know, I, in my heart, I wish they would have kept with it and had, if they'd been able to do great games, they could have survived, in my opinion. They were high priced, mm-hmm. but over time, they would have been able to bring that price down. And if they had just done, Better games, I think they 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 would have survived uh, with that with that product. Because after all, we we never did we make money on hardware. We were always breaking even or or losing a little money on on hardware, depending on the platform. We made all our money on software and accessories. And so, if they had continued with that strategy, uh, I think they could have been successful. Hmm. Yeah, I, I absolutely. As, as someone who was uh, literally like heartbroken. When we got that news, uh, I, I would have definitely uh, wished that they would have kind of uh, stayed the course there. Uh, now, looking back at your time as, as Sega, you know, as a whole, how would you characterize your time there? What would you, you know, if, if there's something that you could kind of say about the company or your time there, you know, how do you remember it well, back then? Well, I just am so thankful I got to work with this great cast of characters you know this great team that we had it was it truly was an extended family and i know people say that stuff a lot but it was special this was very Mm -hmm. very different we were very close we worked very well together we had extremely bright people and uh and uh, that's what i that's what i'm thankful most for i mean we had an opportunity to do something nobody had ever done before we you know we defeated for a while this very large powerful company and had a market share uh, that surpassed theirs. Uh, we did a lot of great things that were breakthrough that I think set the industry on a good base going forward. I mean, the whole idea of extending the age upward certainly was the was the right thing to do. And and uh, look at the history today. Video games are an enormous industry that aren't just a children's business anymore. It's a it's really a a little kids through adult business. I think the average age of the Sony player today, I read somewhere, is like thirty. So wow. So it's it, you know it's a it's a different it's a different industry today and a much larger industry. But I do believe a lot of the things that we started set the groundwork for the progress that the industry has made. And so I'm very thankful to having been part of that and having the opportunity to work with this great team. Amazing. That is that is really amazing. Now. Before you joined Sega, uh, you you referred to yourself as a toy guy. That's what you, you know. You came from your, the toy background. After your time with Sega, what what do you refer your, to yourself at that point? Are you still a toy guy? I'm a reformed toy guy. Now I'm an education <laughs> guy. So you know, I was hired out of Sega by Mike Milken and Larry Ellison to form something that initially was called Education Technology, which used technology to improve education and. Mike had this vision of cradle to grave. We were gonna we were gonna start companies and buy companies that uh, improved education, literally from little kids to post retirees. And basically, we did. You know, over the next nine years, we uh, we acquired or started. We started a lot of companies from scratch, uh, thirty six different companies, and built wow. a huge portfolio. We had when I left in two thousand five, we had revenue over two billion dollars. Uh, our asset value was was uh, about 1.6 billion, and this all started with 500 million dollar investment. Ooh. So it was a great run too, a very different kind of business. Mm-hmm. And I got immersed in education and seeing the power of how technology can really help kids learn, and uh, you know, and do it in a fun and interesting way. And I think Leapfrog's the perfect example of that. I'm mm-hmm. still vice chairman there. I was CEO for many many years. And LeapFrog uses video game technology to make learning to read and learning math and learning science fun and interesting. So mm-hmm. I thank the video game industry for that, too. 
<laughs> that is great. Uh, you know, I know our time here is, is closing very quickly. Uh, do you have a, a few minutes to answer a couple fan questions that people sent in? Sure. Okay, great. Uh, okay, first off, uh, how can you characterize your relationship with David Rosen during your time as president uh, say of Save America? Uh, I think I had a good relationship with, with David. I, you know, it was kind of a funny way I was hired. David wasn't really involved in it, and Nakayama was more involved in it. So I was a little concerned, was I being forced on Dave? But mm-hmm. I, apparently I wasn't. Apparently he was, he was for it. And I think we had a very close relationship. He certainly did not get that involved in the decisions we were making. Uh, I think he... He, I think uh, he agreed with most of them. Um, and, uh, you know, he, I think we surprised him. I think Dave was, was happy. He owned a lot of shares of Sega. And I think uh, we surprised him with our success. And, and uh, I think he was very pleased uh, about it. We had him up, you know, at, at different meetings. We'd, we'd have, and certainly we had a Christmas party. We'd always have Dave up for the Christmas party. But we had other meetings, you know company-wide meetings where we'd celebrate something or another, and we'd invite Dave up, and he'd come up and, and speak to the staff. So I think we had a good relationship. If, if, if I'm wrong on that, I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, okay, next up is uh, what was a worse decision, releasing the Saturn early or releasing the 32X so close to the Saturn launch? Um, I think... That's a good question. They're both bad. Uh, <laughs> I, that's that's a good good one. Gee, I I still think that the Saturn early was probably uh, a bigger mm. mistake. Okay, uh, were there ever any games you regretted not bringing over from Japan? Any games we didn't bring over? It, that you regretted not bringing over from? Oh, Japan. that's a that's a good question, huh? Boy, there were some weird ones, um, <laughs> and sometimes they were successful. I mean, I I'm trying to remember. Let's see, like Wolfenstein and some of these crazy things. That's a good question. I again, you know, I, I tend to only focus on the things that went well, and I <laughs> so I don't remember back then. I'm sure there must have been. There must have been some Japanese right. games that we didn't bring over that were successful there, and then we'd kick ourselves and say, "Why the hell didn't we do that?" <laughs> I think they had the same feeling, by the way. You know, we had oh, we wow. developed a lot of games in the U.S. that they didn't, you know, introduce in Japan. I think they were sorry about later too. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I, I know uh, many of Sega fans today uh, really wish that uh, Sega would bring over uh, some of their newer titles that uh, are staying in Japan uh, right now. But uh, that, that's a really interesting answer right there. Uh, next up is, do you think uh, mobiles, tablets and, and smartphones, will kill consoles? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. No, I don't. But uh, let me tell you something. I am so surprised at the success of games on mobile devices mm-hmm. that, in my opinion, aren't particularly great games. You know, and <laughs> right. and and it never. If I were, I, it's a good thing I'm not making these decisions today because if you had told me you could release a game on smartphones and have it only a quarter finished, and you were releasing it just to see if people liked it, and then you were going to fix it later. <laughs> I would have thought, you're crazy. you got to make a quality product to start with. But that apparently isn't the case on mobile. You can turn out stuff that really is pretty bad and fix it, and people will stick, stick with it and keep playing it. So to me, that's a huge surprise. But no, let me answer the question more specifically, though. I, I, the mobile experience, the tablet experience is fine, but it's very, very different from mm-hmm. sitting in front of a 45-inch screen television and a game console plugged in. And with the with the kind of graphics and involvement you can have through a control device, that's a completely different experience. And it's such a great experience. Right. I, I just don't think that uh, that that's going to go away. Uh, and I and I imagine that the console makers are going to continue improving the the graphics and the interactivity. I mean, already you can't tell the difference. I mean, half the time when my son's playing a football game here, I think I'm watching a football game. <laughs> it is it is quite amazing how advanced they're getting these yeah. days. That's that's absolutely true. Uh you know, next up is uh someone's asked uh there were several canceled Sonic games during your tenure as president of Sega of America, especially if you on the Saturn like Sonic Extreme. Uh what can you tell us about some of those canceled Sonic games? Uh probably not a lot. I mean, I I uh I vaguely remember that and I and I remember that I the one reason was we needed to, I think we chopped a game in half, 
so that we could introduce it. I think I think Sonic Spinball was supposed to actually be more than Sonic Spinball, but we <laughs> chopped it in half so that we could introduce it because of time pressure and and the need to get something into the market to keep the Sonic business uh, alive and healthy. Um, I vaguely remember Sonic Extreme, and I thought it was one of those that we might have chopped in half uh, and and used in another way. But uh, I, I honestly can't can't recall. Once again, you guys were ahead of the, the curve, and y'all were just going the mobile route, releasing a, uh, a half-finished game, and then seeing what happens, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, so uh, one one person asked, uh, during your time at Sega, what would you say was the best part of your job? And if you played video games, what was your favorite video game of all time? Well, that's easy for me. The, my favorite video game was Sonic 2, and I think it is mm. of a lot of uh, Sonic team members. Uh, and the best, the best part of the job, I think I already answered it was, it was hiring these really smart people and surrounding myself with these really smart, uh, uh, teammates and, uh, letting them, uh, come up with crazy ideas that we would then prove to the world weren't so crazy. Uh, and that, that was the most fun. Absolutely. Uh, last question, Tom, uh, do you, can you envision a time where Sega could once again enter the console war? Well, you know, anything's possible. I mean, if they ha- <laughs> technology is an interesting thing, and there's always something on the horizon that is unbelievable to us, right? Sure. And if Sega could come up with that next unbelievable advance uh, in in technology and and incorporate it into a console, I sure hope they'd introduce it. Uh, you know, I, the Sega brand still has a lot of a lot of uh, meaning to a lot of people, and I think if they were able to bring out a superior console again, they could be successful in the console wars once again. Awesome. Uh, I think that's going to uh, to do yeah, it. I think I'm uh, out of time, us, too. Tom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would l- love to uh, to do this again with you. I think Blake actually mentioned it would be fun to get uh, he, uh, you, and Al on the show uh, sometime. That would be an amazing uh, a podcast right there, but I, I do really want to, uh, you know, just say thank you for, for coming on the show and, and speaking with us. Uh, we've wanted to get you on our podcast for, for years now. And now that's happened, uh, it was just such a treat for us. And, you know, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. And I hope all of your followers, uh, do like console wars and get an opportunity to enjoy it. Awesome. Thanks again, Tom. Have a nice day. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye.